We've been in this series on Sunday night, Back to the Basics. I want to say thank you to the church for your response to that. Almost weekly I get comments of how God is ministering and speaking and touching, and that's exactly what we want. We can't improve. We cannot improve on the gospel. Can't do it. Amen. If you'd stand for the reading of God's Word, right now we're involved in the basic doctrines. And we're not going to be covering all of those. We're just going to be covering ones that I think are particular to our identity of who we are as both Christians and Pentecostals. But the one I want to cover tonight is the basic doctrine, I believe, for we Pentecostals. And I believe in this sincerely. And that's the doctrine of divine healing. The doctrine of divine healing. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 15... And Jesus said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. I want to make one thing clear. I'm not going to mention it in the preaching. It's not telling us to take up serpents or drink deadly things. It's saying if we encounter those in the advent of obeying God and preaching the gospel, an example of that was was Paul when he was building the fire after shipwreck and that snake came out of the wood. And bid him. He wasn't trying to pick up snakes. He's picking up firewood. There's a difference. So if there was any doubt in your mind, we will not be bringing the snakes out tonight. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And I read all of that for the context of this. They, the believers, shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. And the Lord, is understood, the Lord confirming the word with signs following. What signs did he use to confirm the word? Verse 17, these signs shall follow them that believe divine healing let's pray heavenly father may this not only be a doctrinal challenge may it be the experience tonight in the house lord would you by your grace and mercy show your power and touch and meet needs tonight in christ's name amen you can be seated we've come to the place in the christian world that if one says they believe in divine healing to a lot of churches and to in a lot of places, when you say you believe in divine healing, they'll look at you like you believe in voodoo or hypnotism or witch doctoring. They put that on the same level. But I believe divine healing is biblical. I believe it's the will of God for the church. I believe it's what He desires to do in our midst. I'm going to take a half a step backwards and say this. We are in particular, and I'm not going to go in this tonight except to make this point. We are classical Pentecostal. Our roots go all the way back to the turn of the last century and beyond. And one thing that was particular about classic Pentecostals is they believed in what they called the four square gospel, or sometimes they just said the full gospel. Well, what was the four square gospel? I want to explain it this way. You see, even though classic Pentecostals are Pentecostal and desire the moving of the Holy Spirit and seek for the moving of the Holy Spirit and hunger for the moving of the Holy Spirit, for the Pentecostal, the classic Pentecostal, it's never been primarily about the Holy Spirit. For the classical Pentecostal, it has always been been about Jesus they never got caught on the rabbit trails of the spirit this the spirit that it was always about Jesus 
And when these Pentecostals got full of the Holy Ghost, the thing that impressed them was the role of Jesus in the life of the believer. And the thing that impressed him about his role is that it wasn't just one role that Jesus had in the life of believers. They said he's got at least four roles. Jesus plays at least four roles in the life of the believer. The four square gospel. The four roles that Jesus plays in the life of the believer. They said, number one, he, Jesus, is Savior. Hallelujah. And they preached it. How many can say amen? Jesus is Savior. Then they said, number two, Jesus is baptizer in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. They said, number three, Jesus is the healer. Jesus is the healer. And number four, Jesus is the coming king. The four square gospel, the role of Jesus in the believer. He is Savior. He is baptizer in the Holy Ghost. He is healer and he's coming king. Others said you missed one. It ought to be a five square gospel because he's also sanctifier. Hallelujah. I believe that. I'm telling you in a nutshell, that's what Pentecost is about. Letting Jesus be everything that he wants to be. I like for him to be everything he wants to be even in this sermon. How many knows he can in this service save and baptize in the Holy Ghost and heal and sanctify and he might even come before the service is over. Well, glory, hallelujah. The four square gospel. Amen. Amen. Before we look at these verses I read to you about divine healing, I want to briefly visit what was considered in those early days of Pentecost, the cornerstone of divine healing. It was simply this. They said that divine healing was provided for in the atonement. What did they mean divine healing is provided for in the atonement? They said this. When Jesus was dying on the cross, when Jesus was shedding his blood on the cross to forgive us our sins and to save us, he was also shedding his blood on the cross to heal us. Amen. He did did both in the atonement. He did both in dying on the cross. Thus, they said, just like salvation is provided for in the atonement, so is divine healing. Calvary saves us and Calvary heals us. And we should believe for healing just like we believe for salvation. We should believe it's in the finished work of Christ on the cross. They use scriptures for that. Isaiah 53 from the Old Testament. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. In the New Testament, the apostle Peter took that up. And in the second chapters of of his first epistle, Peter said, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness and then Peter added by whose stripes we are healed and so this became a debate some would say healing's in the atonement because the Bible says by his stripes ye were healed and they would say that this healing only means spiritual healing it's not in the atonement Amen. The healing, I think I said that backwards, but they would say divine healing is not in the atonement because when it says by his stripes you are healed, it's only talking about spiritual healing, healing from sins. Others would say, no, no, no. When it says by his stripes you were healed, it's not talking about forgiveness of sin and spiritual healing. It's talking about physical healing. Well, I think we've lost something in the debate. I think we've made it too complex and too debatable and too argumentative. I'd like to say two things about that. First of all, I'd like to say when it says by his stripes you're healed, it wasn't just talking
talking about spiritual healing and neither was it just talking about physical healing. As far as I'm concerned, when it says by his stripes ye are healed, I think it means healing of every kind. Spiritual healing and emotional healing and mental healing and physical healing. Whatever kind of healing you need. Amen. By his stripes you are healed. I want to tell you why I believe that. Because Jesus in dying on the cross was trying to take care of what sin messed up. Listen, sin didn't just mess up our spiritual nature. Right here. Sin didn't just mess up our spiritual nature. It messed man up in every way. It messed up the way he thought. It messed up his emotions. That's why people have emotional problems. It messed up not only his mind and his emotions, it even messed up his body. Amen. We know that sin messed up man in every way. But when Jesus died on the cross, he died there to fix and remedy and restore whatever sin messed up. If it messed up the spiritual man, amen, by his stripes, he's going to heal that. If it messed up the emotions, by his stripes he's gone and so I would like to say conclusively tonight amen Jesus came to restore all of man in every way back to the where he was before sin ruined him and so by his stripes we are healed yes it means spiritually thank God he'll heal us spiritually but it means he'll heal our emotions he'll heal our troubled mind and he will heal our sick bodies hallelujah the second thing I would like to say about that discussion as far as I'm concerned the question, the argument is moot. What I mean by that, you can argue whether healing's in the atonement or not but it comes down to this simple point if Jesus had not died if Jesus had not rose again if Jesus had not ascended to the Father if Jesus had not sent back the Holy Spirit there would not be salvation there would not be the baptism of the Holy Ghost and there would not be healing there is healing tonight just like there's salvation because he did die he did rise again he is seated at the right hand of the Father and he is pouring out the Holy Ghost in 2012 Hallelujah. Now, let's look at the scriptures that we read tonight. When a description, as I read to you tonight, was given of New Testament, of the New Testament, here's the kind of description it gave us. In verse 18, it talked about the serpents and the drinking deadly things. But one of the descriptions it gave of the New Testament church is that they, the believers in the church, shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That's the kind of church Jesus founded. That's the kind of church that God wants His church to be where believers lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. But as I look at these verses, I discover some clues for us that if we're going to have divine healing in the church as God desired it, we need to know these important things. And the first of those, and they're all tied together, the first of those is that the supernatural... The signs, the miracles, and the divine healing. The supernatural, the healing is tied to the preaching of the gospel. It's in these verses. When do you have these signs? When do you have divine healing? When the gospel is preached. I want us to take another look at a verse and really think about it. Look at verse 17. Oh, I love the way it sounds and I love to quote it, but I want us to really think about it tonight. It says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. Amen. Nathan, you're going to be these signs. Noah, you be signs. I'm going to be of the believer. Now, I want you to think about this verse. These are the signs that shall follow the believer. I got to think it. My. That's why we're preaching this. <laughs> These signs shall follow them that believe. Thank you. Same right there. 
Now I want you to think about that. I got to think about that all the way. If they're following the believer, that means the believer is going somewhere. Right? Come on, sign. If the signs are following the believer, the believer is going somewhere. Thank you. Well, where is the believer going? Look at verse 15. And Jesus said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And that's what they did. Look in verse 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs falling. How did the signs follow them? They were going somewhere. Jesus said, Go preach the gospel. And it says they went. And as they went... The signs followed. I am convinced the reason we don't see more divine healings and more supernatural interventions of God is because we don't tie them strongly enough to preaching the gospel, sharing the good news. This isn't just talking about the missionary or the evangelist that itinerates to share the good news. Every time we leave the walls of the church into our neighborhoods, the places of employment, wherever we at, we should have the attitude, I am on a mission to share the gospel. And I believe as we share the gospel of Christ, it's in sharing the gospel that God brings these signs to confirm the gospel, the good news that we share. Let me put it another way. Amen. T.L. Osborne used to put it this way. He said, miracles will always follow the plow. Follow the plow. Plows breaking up ground. When we begin to move out with this gospel to new ground beyond the ground we're accustomed to. Amen. You say, I've never knocked on my neighbor's door. And when we begin to break the ground to new territory, amen, miracles will follow. The second thing, and they're all tied together, but from these verses, the purpose of divine healing is first and foremost to confirm the gospel that people might be saved. Listen, God is concerned about people being sick, but people can be sick and go to heaven, but people cannot go to heaven if they're not saved. Amen. And I appreciate that sensitivity. I hear the prayer requests given. Pray for my aunt or my brother. Pray for them that got cancer. Pray that God would heal them. But most most importantly, here's what I hear. Most importantly, pray for them because they're lost and they need to be saved. The first thing on God's agenda is the salvation of the lost. Amen. So the purpose of divine healing is to confirm the gospel so that people can get saved. You see, as we look at this, amen, the main purpose of healing in Scripture is not just to alleviate suffering. Now, I want to tell you something. God doesn't like to see people people suffer. That's why he sent Jesus to die on the cross. But the main purpose of healing isn't just to keep people from suffering. And by the way, even those that follow Christ, one day God is going to totally take away suffering from all of his people. How many believes that? I'm telling you in heaven, there'll not be one pain. I mean, there won't be one sickness. There won't be one disease. God's concerned about our suffering. And one day he will alleviate it. But the purpose of healing is not just to alleviate suffering. The purpose of healing is not just the excitement of a miracle. Now listen, miracles are exciting. I'm telling you if there's anything that's exciting, it's to see a miracle. But that's not the first and foremost purpose. The purpose of miracles are not to make a celebrity out of the man or woman that prayed for someone. I remember years ago we had a prayer line in the boys' dorm. And we lined up. On, there's a bunch of us lined up down the hall on either side. And those that were sick went down between them. After we got through, there was one guy got up. He testified. He said, I had the worst headache I ever had. But as I walked through that prayer line tonight, and, 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 and you men began to lay your hands on me, he said, suddenly my headache was gone. And oh, we rejoiced. I remember afterwards, though, my roommate said to me, he said, every boy in that prayer line was thinking it was them that when they laid their hands on him, that was the moment his headache went away. 
You see, the purpose of miracle isn't to make a celebrity out of the person that prayed for them. We've got a lot of that. It seems like they've forgotten the purpose of miracles isn't to put your name in bright lights, get you a television show, help you raise money, and build a ministry empire. That's not the purpose of miracles. The purpose of miracles is simply this, to impress the people that see it, the miracle, that the gospel is true, that God really can forgive their sins. God really can take them from the pit of sin and bring them to a place that they are ready for eternity and spend it with Him. That's the purpose of miracles. You see, when people hear and accept the gospel because it's been confirmed by divine healing and miracles, that brings glory not to man. It brings glory to God. I begin to wonder if in our church world we would begin to make divine healing totally about the glory of God, not just the alleviation of suffering, not just about the sensation of a miracle, not just about big ministries, but if we'd make divine healing about the glory of God, if we wouldn't say, oh, hallelujah, I'm telling you, if we'll give Him the glory, hallelujah, and nothing gives God the glory like the gospel being preached and somebody being rescued from the flames of hell. And then, I believe divine healing happened when and where God was doing something new. You see, you can read about miracles in the Bible. And there are miracles all through the Bible. But the clusters of miracles. When miracles are happening all at once. When they're occurring frequently. Was always when God was doing something new. You read quite a few chapters where you begin to read miracles. But when God decided to deliver his people Israel out of bondage, you begin to see miracles. The water turns to blood. The Red Sea opens up. Quail come. Manna comes. The sun stands still. Why? Because God, oh, that just goes with my point here. You know when you're going to see miracles? When you begin to see God through the gospel deliver people from Egyptian bondage. Hallelujah. Later, God's people backslid. God sent the prophets Elijah and Elisha to turn his people from Baal worship. God was doing everything he could to turn them from Baal worship. He meant to bring revival. What do you see? You saw, you saw miracles. The dead raised to life. Fire out of heaven. Burning up even water. Why? God through the miracles was doing something new and trying to turn people to God all through the Bible. The birth of Christ. God's doing something new. Miracles on every hand. The ministry Mystery of Christ, miracles. God's doing something new. Oh, hallelujah. He ascends to the Father and suddenly there's miracles everywhere. Why? God's doing something new. He's pouring out the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, you want to see a miracle? Pray, oh God, do something new. God, use me. Use our church. But God, break new ground. Do something new. God will begin to move with miracles. I want to begin to bring this all together and say I honestly believe as we try to get people saved we'll see an increase of miracles and divine healing. We believe in divine healing and as we seek to see people saved it'll happen. It's always been that way. Philip the deacon we mentioned him the other night he got a burden to see those old half-breed Samaritans saved and so he went to Samaria Not to heal. He went to Samaria to see them turn to Christ. And what did he preach? The Bible said, and he preached Christ. But as he preached Christ, the Bible said, demons came out crying. And many were healed of the palsies. And many lame were made to walk. Because as Philip preached Jesus, that Jesus came amongst them and healed. And when they saw the healing, They knew the Christ that Philip preached was alive and risen. Hallelujah. That's the way it works. Try to get people saved and God begins to move. I remember years ago in some personal evangelism book written by a Pentecostal. I can't tell you exactly what it said, but it said something like this. We ought to go door to door talking to our lost neighbors about Christ. But it said one thing to be on the lookout for and maybe even 
ask, is there anyone sick in that house that you went to share the gospel in? And if there is someone sick in that house, don't just tell them about Christ and try to lead them to the Lord, but at some point, ask their permission to pray for the sick one and believe that God will heal that sick one so that that family, that person, can see that the gospel that you share is the truth. How many believe the gospel is the truth? Hallelujah. I think of the Muslims today. What the untold story is that many of them are getting saved. But there is hardly ever a Muslim that gets saved without something miraculous happening. A healing, a visitation of an angel. It's because of their worldview. It's because of how bound they are in their religion. But God is working miracles among the Muslims and turning many of them to the Lord. It gets dangerous even to put a thing like that on the tape. But it... Uh, the CD, whatever, the digital bites. Amen. It gets dangerous to put it there, but it's the truth. Why? Because when people see the hand of God, they're going to believe the heart of God towards them. Amen. 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 Then I want us to know that the divine healer uses human instrumentality. The divine healer uses human instrumentality. I want you to notice what it said here in what we read tonight. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Amen. Believers only work the miracle in this sense. They are the vessel through which the Lord works. They are the vessel through which God heals. Yes, they shall lay hands on the sick and recover, but the believer's really not the healer. They're only the vessel or the channel or the instrument of the healer. I know that's basic, but we got to get it. And an age that uplifts a man as a healer or a woman as a healer, it's not the believer that's the healer, it's Christ that's the healer. Oh, ever since I've been preparing this afternoon, all I can hear is that old song, the healer healer is here. Jesus the healer. Oh, it's Jesus that's the healer. Hallelujah. But he uses human instrumentality. I want you to look at verse 20 again. They went forth and preached everywhere the Lord working with them. It said they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. But it said and the Lord working with him. It was the Lord that worked the miracle. In James chapter 5, is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. They're the instruments anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord Jesus or in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. They prayed, but the Lord did the raising. <laughs> oh, oh, hallelujah. I want to make clear, it's not man that heals. But I also want to make clear, thank God, he does choose to use, use human vessels. Hallelujah. I like to visualize this. I really do. This got to hold me some years back. Amen. Come help me some young men. Come on. Come on, Jerry, you help me. Come on, you first three here, four. Come on, help me here. Hallelujah, we're going to have divine healing. Praise God. Okay, you're going to be sick. Look sick. You're really sick. It's contagious at that. These are the believers. I'm going to be Jesus. I usually let someone else, but I'm going to be Jesus. Hallelujah, I want to tell you what this says. It said, and they... Hallelujah. They shall lay hands on the sick. Go ahead and lay hands. Now, I'm going to have you back your hand off and do that again in a moment. Amen. Go ahead and lay hands. We're practicing. Okay, now take your hand back and wait till I get done. It said, they shall lay hands on the sick, but it said, and the Lord working with them. Here's what I like to envision. We call someone up that's sick. We ask for the elders to come, the ministering brethren, whoever else would like to help us pray, the believer. Amen. It's not in a priesthood of a few. It's in the priesthood of all believers. And they shall lay hands on the sick. Here's what I like to envision. Here's the believers. I'm Jesus. I, I 
I look down. All right, go ahead and lay hands on him. I see that they're laying hands on him. And so I go ahead, and since they're laying hands on him, I join my hand as the Savior with theirs. Hallelujah. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall. I want us to believe that when we pray, amen, Jesus will come by. He'll add his hand. Hallelujah. Oh, that's what we're doing anyway. When you believers are placing your hand upon the sick, you're saying, oh God, you put your hand on him. Oh God, we're touching him. Lord, but you touch him. Lord, we're praying for him. But Lord, you raise him up. Amen. Thank you. He uses human instrumentality I'll never forget when this was made real to me it was when, one of the times I got aggravated at someone I was trying to help serve the Lord don't look at me like you never have have you ever tried to help someone and they didn't cooperate you got just plain aggravated at them. I was trying to help someone they got saved they were an alcoholic they did real good well for a while I was working with them closely I started getting calls. They were back in the mental health of the hospital from drinking, alcoholic. I got everything done one Saturday. was just getting ready to relax. And I got a call begging me to come one more time. Messed up one more time on alcohol. I didn't really want to go. I was pretty aggravated. Wouldn't follow advice. Wouldn't follow counsel. And so, but I went ahead and went. I walked in the door a little bit aggravated. I talked. I'm afraid it showed. You can use the Bible many different ways. <laughs> but I said, all right, let's pray. And I was on this side of the bed, Sister Rose, and I left the door open a crack this big. And the wind, it was at the end of the hall, and, and there was sunshine coming in the wind to end the door there. And I said, let's pray. And I laid my hand on him. And I'm not a mystical person. But I'll tell you one thing. When I began to pray, I felt Jesus come through the crack of that door I felt him walk up to that bed and place his hand on that man and that man began to weep and call out on the name of the Lord Hallelujah. I didn't deserve to be the instrument. Amen. But I did have faith that day that it's not just up to me. I can't raise up anybody, but I can pray. And I can believe as I lay my hand. Amen. If you're sick tonight, there's not a one of us that can raise you up. But we can lay hands and believe in the Lord. And the Lord can lay hands and raise up. How many believe he wants to do it tonight? Hallelujah. Now I ask the question, how does Jesus do it? When he, how did he do it then when he wasn't even there? How does he do it now when he's not here physically? Look in verse 19. It says, so then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and he sat on the right hand of God. Then it says in verse 20, they went forth ever and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. How is the Lord working with him when he went to heaven and he's seated at the right hand of God? How does he do that? How does that make sense, Sister Brock? The verse says he went and he sat himself, sat himself on the right, and yet the next verse said he went with them and he worked with them. How does he do that when he's seated at the right hand of the Father? I'll tell you how he does it. Because when he seated himself at the right hand of the Father, he poured out the Holy Ghost. How does he go with us? Through the power of the Holy Ghost. How does he work with us? Through the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, when the Holy Ghost is at work, that is Jesus at work. When the Holy Ghost is here, Jesus is here. When the Holy Ghost touches, Jesus touches. Oh, what a gospel. I'm about done. Just one more thing, but I want to stop and think about Peter and John. I love that story. Going to the temple to pray. That man had been lame from his mother's womb. He had never, ever walked. No muscle memory, no equilibrium, no apparatus even to walk. They laid him there to beg. He was begging that day when Peter and John were headed to prayer meeting. Poor preachers that they were, Peter looked on him and said, Silver and gold, have I none, but such as I have. I wonder if that ever happened if they'd been on their way to the ball game. <laughs> Silver and gold, have I none, 
but such as I have in the name of Jesus rise and take up thy bed and you know what he said he took him by the hand and he raised him none trying to teach him I'm not going to have you do this tonight but none trying to teach him how to walk the Bible said he began to leap and he held on to Peter and John not to steady himself because he is so excited and he leapt up and out oh I could preach all night on that and for the first time because lame people weren't allowed to go in the temple for the first time the first place he headed he went into the temple of God gives a whole new meaning I will enter his courts with thanksgiving in my heart hallelujah I'm telling you he was excited and a crowd began to gather around but I want you to notice the attitude of Peter and John I'm talking about really seeing God move and work miracles look at the attitude of Peter and John when the crowd gathered around Peter said this why do you marvel number one would you expect anything less of God don't you know God couldn't do anything but then he immediately said, Why do you look on us as though through our own power and holiness we have made this man to walk? The first thing in the attitude of Peter and John is quit looking at us. It's not about us. It's about our Savior. Why do you look at us like it's through our power of holiness? Peter said, it's not through us, but it was by faith in his name that hath made this man sound, whom you see and know, yea, it was faith by him and through him that hath made this man strong in the presence of you all. It was Jesus, he said. And I'm telling you, that's exactly why that miracle was work. There were men who were willing to give the glory and point the attention to Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Last of all, divine healing is often a gift given to some within the church. In 1 Corinthians 12, it's been telling us that the Spirit gives severally to every person as He will. And it says to another, He gives faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. There are some real sincere Christians that can begin to be disturbed because they have never seen anyone healed through their ministry. But before you get disturbed, I want to call it to mind, the Bible said that John the Baptist did no miracle. God had another purpose and ministry for him. So I want to make very clear, we can all pray, but this is a special gift that the Spirit gives some folks. He doesn't give it to everyone. He gives it to some. It's the gift of faith, the gift of healing, and the gift of miracles. Now, first of all, notice if He gives it to them, it's not something that they can claim that was of them because it comes from Him. But I thank God that he has put in the body those that do have the gifts of healing. You see, again, some folks get this so backwards. The gift of healing isn't this resident power that God gives to somebody that they learn how to wield and do things with. They miss it. The gift of healing is a spirit-inspired ability to believe that Christ will do the healing. And I believe it even goes beyond that. I believe someone that has the gift of healing, not only do they have the spirit inspiration to believe, but they are able to inspire the church to believe God for a healing. I believe God uses folks that way. It doesn't always have to be a preacher. I've seen many times that the person in the congregation with the gift of healing was not the preacher quote unquote but they were able to believe God that Jesus was going to do the healing you know that, that's, that's the danger of making it about the guy that holds the microphone or sings and everything that he's the healer no Jesus is the healer but beyond that God uses different believers that may not even be in full time he uses them to have the gift of healing to believe that Christ at that moment is going to heal Oh, I want to see folks healed. We need, we need to see folks healed. It's in Jesus. It's in Jesus. You say, wait a minute. Now, I'm not going to go into this, but for one second, and I'm done tonight. I've already talked about miracles in that apologetic sense. Tonight, I'm not doing that. 
I just want to simply say this. Some people say, well, why should we pray tonight and believe God to heal when we prayed other times and he didn't heal? I wish folks would quit looking at the times when God didn't heal and look at the times when he did heal. Why do I preach divine healing when every time that we pray, folks don't get healed? The same reason I keep preaching on salvation, even when sometimes I preach and folks don't get saved. It's called, it's because it's the truth. And you never know when the moment's going to come that someone's going to say yes and there's going to be a visitation from on high. Truth is truth. Hallelujah. Would you come, music? And so I think tonight, instead of focusing on the times God didn't heal, let's just focus on the times that He has. You know, Brother Cruz, there's a lot of things that I don't understand. I've seen sick people pray, and the person they prayed for got healed. But before that's too far beyond our understanding, remember, it was the one that was bleeding from his wounds that heals. Amen. I don't begin to confess that I understand it all. I just know what the record is and what the book says. And it says they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I could share different instances, but in closing, I'm going to share one or two. When I was about 13 years old, we got acquainted with the Osho, went there for their special meeting. They had it at the church at the time. It was crowded. Young man I met at camp, he brought me up front about a third of the way up, about, about where Aaron Magger's family is seated, and we were sitting in the middle, and it was all new to me. I'd never been in that big a crowd of church. My, my home church ran about 40 or 50. I'd never been in that size church at all, and that, that was kind of overwhelming. Oh, it was a good service. I never saw people worship like that, pray, get in. I don't know how it all started, but they started praying for folks. And I was close enough I could see there was an elderly lady in the church. She couldn't hardly walk, just real feeble, couldn't hardly get around. I don't remember if they brought her up in a wheelchair or what, but I do remember that they couldn't hardly get her up there to be prayed for. And two preachers began to pray for her. And I happened to be looking right at her when it happened. All of a sudden, the Holy Ghost went, Whew! and that elderly lady who couldn't hardly walk, took off running. I'm telling you, when she ran by, whoo, there's no acting. There's no illusion. That was not psychological manipulation of a crowd. That was a divine healing of the Lord. And those preachers couldn't hardly keep up with her as she went around the building. I'm telling you, I don't, I don't mean this disrespectful, but when you get that old, you can be perfectly normal and it still take a miracle to run like that. Amen. I knew it was real. Next thing I want to tell you, you say, Pastor, you've told that a hundred times. Well, I want to keep telling it. Look at the things the Lord has done. When we first came here, Sandra developed a lump in her body. It had been there for a long time. She went to the doctor on a Saturday. While she was gone, I began to mow the lawn. She came home. I could see she was crying for she got out of the car. And this thing was large. I stopped the mower and I said, what did the doctor say? She said, the doctor said, I've got to be at the surgery first thing Monday morning. I said, well, I'm about done. Go in the house. I'll be there in a minute. Just had another round to make, put the lawnmower up. As I made that other round, I can still remember where it was at. I began to pray. I said, oh, God. I said, you know, we don't need this. This isn't good. I just begin to pray. It's something when I really get in trouble, I always just start saying, Father, oh, Father. And I begin to pray. Amen. I begin to seek the Lord. I, I turned the lawnmower up, and I put it in the garage, and I went in, and I said, Honey, check one more time. I watched her check. Her face lit up. She began to say, It's gone. I, she just got back from the doctor. It's gone. Just like that. He can heal. Oh, how, how many believes the healer is here? I'm not talking about a man. I'm talking about Jesus. 
I want us just to worship Him right now. Before we do anything else, let's uplift Jesus. Let's praise Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Oh, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Hallelujah. Lord, it's not by might and it's not by power, but it's by Your Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Would you stand across the building? Amen. Brother Tim Hunley was supposed to get out of the hospital today, but this afternoon a complication arose. And he needs a special touch tonight that God would help him, that his body will not reject that kidney. I I wonder who would come right now and stand in for Brother Tim tonight. Is there anyone that would come right now? Brother Cecil's coming. Amen. We're going to believe God for him. Brother Cruz, I don't know if you want to stay right back there tonight. If you're not able to come, that's fine. We'll send men back there to pray with you. But I wonder who else in the house. You need a divine touch of God. You need a divine touch of God tonight. I want to invite you to come. I believe Brother Cruz is coming. Let's give him time to come down the aisle. Hallelujah. Listen, medically there's nothing else they can do for Brother Cruz. But I know the God that made these bodies. Hallelujah. Brother Cruz, is there anything too hard for the Lord? No, sir. No, sir. Hallelujah. Amen. There's struggles here that we need not have because He's the light. Remember what I preached? Don't get caught in that trap. By His stripes we are healed. That's just spiritual. That's just physical. That's emotional. That's in every way, every part, every way. By His stripes we are healed. Are there others you'd like to come tonight? We're going to wait just a moment. Just a moment. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Elders and ministering brethren, would you join me on the platform tonight? I want to make more room for the church. Amen. Amen. I want everyone that will to gather around these as we pray for them tonight. We're going to do what the Bible says. We're going to anoint with oil. We're going to pray, but it's going to be the Lord that raises them up. I want you to believe, you that are up here to be prayed for, I want you to believe when we lay hands on you that Christ is going to put His hand on you. Amen. Christ is going to lay His hand on you. Amen. Everyone get in as close as you can. Amen. We're going to anoint these with oil. Amen. We're going to pray for them. We're going to begin down here with Brother Cruz and come across. Amen. But I want everyone that would to come and lay hands. Let's believe the Lord. It's not by might and it's not by power. It's by my spirit, saith the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. One more time as we begin to pray. I want us to uplift Jesus. It's about Jesus. Hallelujah. He's the one. Hallelujah. If he forgave your sin, he can heal your body. Hallelujah.